Hello, and welcome to Faith Assembly. As we count down to our worship celebration, we are here to highlight some of the amazing things God is doing here and to tell you about our church. We also have online options where we live stream every Sunday morning on our Facebook page. If you are new to Faith Assembly, we'd like for you to grab a Connect card and take it to our Connection Center in the lobby. We want to meet you and give you a free gift. To be encouraged and get weekly updates about our church, follow us on Instagram at MyFaithAG or like our Faith Assembly Facebook page. There are so many amazing things happening here on a weekly basis, starting with our Sunday morning worship celebrations at 9 and 1045, where we come together to celebrate everything God has done in our lives. One of the best ways to get connected is to join one of our connect groups. Connect groups provide a way for people to grow in Christ and fellowship with other believers. To view a full list of our connect groups, visit faith-assembly.org slash connect or visit our connect center in the lobby. If you have kids in your family, we encourage you to check out Faith Kids. Faith Kids meet every Sunday at 9 and 1045 in Studio 127. At Faith Kids, we are passionate about creating an environment where kids can experience God in a way that they'll never forget. Parents have the freedom to worship in the main service while their kids are safe and secure in praising God, meeting new friends, and learning about God's Word. For all middle and high school students, we have Faith Youth, where we are creating a welcoming and exciting atmosphere where students can grow in their love for Jesus and each other. Faith Youth meets every Sunday at 6 p.m. in the Student Center, where they are taught the Bible in a relevant and exciting way. If you are a college-age student, we would like to invite you to Pulse College Ministry. We meet on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. for an awesome time of connecting with other students and experiencing a challenging message. To stay connected or to learn more, follow us on Instagram at Pulse College Ministry and like our Facebook page. Where are all the ladies at? Women and teen girls, Faith Women is for you. We have so many opportunities to get connected and be a part of this awesome community. Power of Parties, Growth Groups, and our annual Gather Conference in September. To stay connected with Faith Women, join the Faith Women Facebook group. And for the guys, we have Faith Men. Faith Men are challenged to live out God's view of manhood and are empowered to be better husbands, fathers, and leaders. We have several opportunities to get connected through Bible studies and connection points. To stay connected, be sure to join the Faith Men Facebook page. Wednesday nights at Faith Assembly are for the whole family. Join us Wednesday nights nights at 7 p.m. for a variety of activities that will help you grow with your walk with Jesus. Our faith kids will have a blast in Impact Girls and Royal Rangers clubs where they engage in fun and challenging activities like earning badges, going on exciting trips, and growing deeper in Christ. For all middle and high school students, we offer a variety of activities including Bible studies, leadership development, and midweek madness parties that allow students to grow deeper in friendships and God's Word. For the adults, we have midweek Bible study. During this time, you will be challenged with relevant topics that you can use in your everyday life. Wish that you could rewatch that worship experience from this past week? You actually can. Visit our YouTube channel or download the Faith Assembly Church app to access it at any time throughout your week. Thank you again for joining us at Faith Assembly. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged by our service today. Welcome home.
morning, we want to invite you to stand up on your feet this morning and let's just start this new year, the first Sunday of the new year, off right by telling God how glorious he is. He is. Glorious. Shout it out.
God, we thank you for who you are. Wow, God is doing some amazing things in this church, and we are so excited about them. And we want you to take a quick look at some of the things that are coming up here at Faith Assembly. Good morning, and welcome to Faith Assembly Church. We are so excited that you chose to join us today. If you are new here at Faith, we want to invite you to stop by our welcome desk in the lobby to receive more information about life at Faith and a free gift. Connect groups are an integral and exciting part of life here at Faith Assembly Church. Therefore, we're hosting a Connect Group Fair Sunday, January 12th, immediately following both of the morning services. We hope you'll stop by and find a group so you can plug in, get connected, grow, and go. Hey, Faith Women, we are so excited about all the things coming up for 2020. We have so much to share with you. But first, I just want to let you know that we are so excited that Shonda Pierce is coming to Faith Assembly. Now, the tickets are selling fast. She's going to be here on March 20th at 7 p.m. You know you want to be here for a fun girls' night. So be sure not to delay to go ahead and get your tickets. You can go to Shonda.org or you can click on the Facebook event and grab your tickets. Get them soon. Also, for this particular event, men, you're welcome to come as well. We're looking forward to a great night. Get your tickets. We wanted to remind you guys about our Wednesday night family night that happens at 7 p.m. every Wednesday night right here at Faith Assembly. We've got options for the entire family. I lead the Bible study here for ages 12 to 18, and Daniel Allette does the bi adult Bible study. Daniel, would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been privileged to do the Bible study for the adults, and uh, we have a blast. We have a great time interacting and sharing with each other, and it's, you know, iron sharpens iron, and so we take it uh, seriously as we come together, and uh, it's, it's, I promise you, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And then we got Commander Corey here with our Royal Rangers. That's right, I'm privileged to work with the young guys uh, from first grade to fifth grade. We encourage you to come out every Wednesday night. We have a great time where we do projects and we do Bible study together and we just learn how to live life together and uh, grow up to be great men of God. We just want to encourage all the young men to come join us. Yeah, can't wait to see you guys here every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Assembly and Happy New Year 2020 is here and I am so excited not only about all the events and things like we just saw in the video but I am even more excited about all that God is going to do in and through us this year. I'm so excited about what God is going to do right here at Faith Assembly this year because as you've heard before there is such an expectancy for what God is going to do in and through us as we look to him in this new year. I was thinking about this scripture verse and I want to share it with you this morning and it is Isaiah 43:19. It says, "See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it?" I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Can I tell you this morning that just because you haven't seen your miracle come to pass as you are expecting it to doesn't mean that the answer is not on the way. It doesn't mean that God has not heard you, that he does not see you. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you're believing for something, Maybe you prayed for it yesterday and you didn't see it come to pass. Can I challenge you to pray for it again today? Maybe you're praying and believing for it today and you don't see it come the way that you're asking God for it to come. Can I challenge your heart this morning to ask Him for it one more time? Get up tomorrow and believe for it again, knowing that we serve a God who truly is able to do more than we could even think or imagine. Do you believe that in the house today? I know you do. I know I'm surrounded by a group of people this morning with expectant hearts who want to come into this place and they want to receive all that God has for them. I know a lot of times we as Christians, if we aren't careful, we can find ourselves in a place of only hoping and wishing. Only hoping and wishing that things would change in our lives. Only hoping and wishing that those around us would surrender their hearts to the Lord. Only hoping and wishing that God would grant us what we are asking. But can I challenge us this morning that this year is going to be different. We aren't just going to hope and wish, but we're going to intercede. And we're going to do as the Bible says when it says to the believers, pray and believe in who God is and know that he will not fail you. Anybody want to stand up in this place this morning and begin to praise God? Can put 
put every bit of our hope and trust in and know that at the right time, at the right time when you're ready to receive it, your miracle will come at, because we serve an on-time God. And at the right moment, at the right time, when God's got everything lined up, you're going to receive what you've been asking God for. And I believe with all of my heart, this is the year. This is the year that we're going to see God do amazing things. Lord, we lift our hands, we lift our hearts in this place today. God, we are nothing without you. Lord, we are interceding, we are crying out, we are coming into this place with expectant hearts, God. We are asking you, God, to send miracles, to send blessings like never before. Lord, we ask for our lost loved ones, God, to come and surrender their hearts to you. God, we're asking for restored relationships. God, we're asking for financial miracles. God, we're believing for healings in the house, even starting today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we don't look to you as a God that we just hope or wish in, but we look to you, God, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we know that your name is above every name, and everything that comes against us in this life has to bow at your name, and we receive that in fullness today. Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we are rejoicing this morning. We are rejoicing this morning already in the breakthroughs and the miracles that we'll see in the coming year. In the name of Jesus, I pray it. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today.
Hallelujah. Let's sing that out.
every prayer that I pray that you answered, I say. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Yeah. My God, that is who you are. Come to the 
this offer and altar and give it all to God and say, God, I will worship you and give you praise before I see my breakthrough. I will give you praise because I know that you are my way maker, the miracle worker, the healer. Come on, lift your hands and praise him. our biggest our biggest healing and our biggest breakthrough is just on the other side of stepping out in faith that is who promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, even when As we were singing this, I'm reminded of when Jesus walked this earth at the pool of Bethesda. And so many people were sitting around the pool. And when the waters were stirred, there was a rush to get in. And the kicker was only one was healed. But this morning, I see the same pool, the same waters are here this morning, and they're being stirred. But the thing is, is that God wants to do it for each and every one of you. He wants that healing. He wants that breakthrough. But I can't make you do it. I can't make you step out. Nobody can make that decision for you. But I can encourage you. I want you to do this for me. Whatever it is that your circumstance is, whatever it is, that situation that you're facing, that impossibility that has been in your life, that has been standing before you, that roadblock, block, that wall that you feel like you can't get through, I want you to close your eyes and begin to thank God. Say, God, you know what? Even though I don't see it, you're working. Even though I don't feel it, you're working. And I'm going to give you praise. I challenge you this morning to step into the waters. Step into the waters and see what God will do. Come on, sing this again, even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never
and what we need to walk in and what we need to live by is that if we will stand in faith even when we can't see it even when we can't feel it God is in the middle of that mess and God is working to make that mess a blessing the word says he works all things together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. I declare and decree to you today, whatever you're going through, however it looks, God is still working. He is still on the throne. He is still able. He is healing your body. He is reviving your life. He is saving your children. He is redeeming. He is restoring. Whether or not you can see it, is yet to come but he's at work amen do you believe that if you believe that today would you just give a big shout of praise this morning thank you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah well praise the Lord we're gonna we're gonna ask our ushers to come and wait on you for the morning tithe and offering today and as they're coming I just want to encourage you that Pastor Trey mentioned in the first service, and I'll echo that, that receipt is contingent upon expectation. Well, I'll say that again, receipt is a contingent upon expectation. In other words, we get what we came for. And I believe we're in the midst of a people this morning who came expecting God to move. Amen. Who came into 2020 to the first worship service and said, I'm hungry for a new thing in my life. I'm hungry for a new thing to be done in my heart. And I come expecting God to do exceeding abundantly above everything that I think or ask today. And God bless you. I pray that he fills your heart to overflowing today. Amen. 
Amen. Well, certainly he's blessed us in the past year, and we enter into this new year. We want to we wanna worship the Lord with our giving and honor him with the first fruits of our offering and our increase today. And we just want to take this moment at the dawning of a brand new year and say thank you so much for your faithful and continued support. Uh, we believe that God is about to open some amazing doors for us in 2020 and just encourage you that we need your faithful and continued support to see that happen and that lives are going to be touched and changed here in this community. Do you believe that? Amen. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for the fulfillment of your promise that you are a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. And Lord, we just come to you because we know you're a promise keeper. We honor you with the first fruits of our offering today, God, knowing that you will give back to us, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Lord, we ask you to use this offering, bless both the gift and the giver, and use it for the glory, the upbuilding of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give today. any foretaste of what 2020 will be like I am excited come on somebody amen amen well pastor Lisa here we are on the dawning of a brand new year and if you don't know here at Faith Assembly Church we are very much uh, believers in vision and purpose and that God has a plan and that we need to move in that plan. And we believe in that so strongly because there's an old adage that says, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Yeah, and we're not wanting to aim at nothing, but we're wanting to believe God for everything that he has in store for us. So every year we begin at the close of, towards the close of a year, we begin to seek the Lord and just say, God, what's your direction? What's your vision? What's your purpose in leading this church for the coming year? And last year, we focused on moving forward and just really, you know, encouraged people in that. And as the year continued to unfold, we just heard so many incredible testimonies. Uh, people in their personal lives and spiritually just taking huge strides. And the closer we got to the close of the year, the more we talked about it. And I just said, you know, Pastor Lisa, I don't believe that the Lord is done with faith assembly and this idea of moving forward I think there's more territory to claim I think there's more ground to gain and you know I just don't think we can stop I just we just can't stop and she said I said we won't stop won't stop so we said then our vision and direction for this year is God has begun a good thing in us and we can't stop and we won't stop moving forward. Amen. So there we go. That's your, that's your mission. That's our mission as a church this year. 
that the momentum and the trajectory that God put us on in the previous year, we can't stop. We won't stop moving forward, right? Yes, we serve Absolutely. a God that constantly pursues us. Isn't that amazing? He it is. constantly pursues us with his love. And you know what? We are so excited because we know in the coming year, with the theme, can't stop, won't stop, that maybe many of you have moved forward in 2019. But can I tell you this morning that 2020 has greater things in store. That's right. 2020 has deeper, yes. greater blessings in store. That's and right. it is going to be a year of miracles. Yes. We are going to see God do amazing things. And because of who God is, we can come with expectant hearts and know that he is not going to fail us in 2020. We can't stop. And and we won't stop because of who God is. Amen. Amen. Honey, let's pray over this group today. Father, we love you and we thank you for your promise. Lord, we thank you for divine instruction, vision, direction, Lord. Yes. And Father, as 2020 unfolds, I pray over every individual under the sound of our voice today, Lord, whether in this congregation, those watching by internet, those who will tune in later on podcast, Lord, we just pray blessing and abundance in their lives, Lord. We pray that 2020 is a year of dynamic unfolding and, and blessing in their lives. Father, that this would be the year and the season that they see you do exceeding abundantly above everything that they've ever thought or imagined. And Lord, we declare it not only for the individual, but for our church collectively, God, that we would see deliverances, that we would see healings, that we would see salvations, that we would see moves of the Holy Spirit in ways like never before. And Father, we receive that promise in Jesus' name. And all God's people shouted, amen, amen. God bless you, church. Um, if you're ready to get in the word this morning, would you grab your Bible and turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, and we're launching a series, a series of messages this morning that we've entitled Gaining Ground. Gaining Ground. We've started moving in the past year, but this year we want to gain some ground. We really want to make some advances and some great strides uh, towards God's purpose in our lives. And um, today I want to share with you a message that I've entitled Get Out and Stay Out. Babylon. So that'll make sense to you a little bit later on as we move through this message. But today I want to begin by speaking with you about a few historical figures that we run into here and we find their accounts in the book of Daniel. They are three, uh, four Hebrew youngsters that we know most familiar by the names of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these four young men were, were Hebrew youngsters, as we said, and we've come to know their stories very well. They, they're stories of courage and faithfulness. They're stories of an unwavering faith in God's power to deliver them from any circumstance. And, you know, one of the most impressive things about this is that many of the um, things that, you know, it's easy for us to forget sometimes that many of the things for which these young men are most well known happened in the days of their youth so if you're here this morning and you think wow I'm in big church and I'm just waiting for this to get over and this is not applicable I challenge you today that it is very much applicable because you too can do great things for the kingdom of God now these young men lived in the southern kingdom of Judah uh, after a divided kingdom there in Israel, and they, they lived in the southern portion of Judah. The king Nebuchadnezzar became the king of Babylon. He went in and besieged the land of Judah. The officials of Babylon were instructed that they were to go through that province of Judah and they were to find the best and the brightest, those with the greatest potential, and they were to bring those young men back to Babylon and there they were going to be trained in the culture and the ways of the Babylonians and they were going to receive instruction in the Babylonian ways and culture that in order that they would be prepared to serve in the king's palace. Now before we go much further in this I want to explain to you where it was that these people were being taken to. They were being taken to a land called Babylon. Now, Babylon gets its root, or has its root in the word Babel, 
Okay, I know that's really deep and profound for you here this morning. But if you will remember in Genesis chapter 11, there's an account there of a rebellious people who went to the plain of Shinar and there they began to build a tower. A tower that uh, was to ascend into the heavens and God was displeased with this action and he looked down at them and said, what are we going to do to stop them? They're, they're all one, they have the same language and I've got I've to intervene here, I've got to do something to put a halt to this. So he says, I'm going to go down and I'm going to confuse their language. So we take the root of the word Babylon and we add that to it, that understanding, then Babylon equals a place of confusion. A place of confusion. Now I want to talk to you for just a minute about these young men and their experience in Babylon. And then we're going to make a parallel between that and our own existence. Number one is that the very first thing that we see happening to these four young men that's accounted for here in the scriptures in verses 6 and 7 is that when Daniel and his friends arrive, the first thing the Babylonians do is try to change their names. They had all been given Hebrew names, and you've got to understand, in our culture a lot of times we just, you know, something sounds pretty. And therefore, whatever sounds pretty to us or whatever's popular in culture at the time, we then name our children that based on the way it sounds rolling off our tongues. And that's about as deep as it gets for most people. But in this culture and in this time especially, there was a deep meaning to what someone was named. They thought about it. There was a painstaking thought put into what am I going to name this child because what I name them is a declaration about them. And they had been given these Hebrew names. They're not, it's not Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was actually Daniel, which means God is my judge. In other words, he's the one who measures me. He's the one who determines my worth. He sets my value. It's God who is my judge. No other. There was Hananiah, who his name means God has favored. In other words, everything that I achieve or everything that I attain in this life is because Jehovah has shown his favor in my life. There was Mishael, which means who is what God is. In other words, his name is a rhetorical question because we understand from Scripture that there is no other God like Jehovah. There, we, we can look throughout the universe and the eons of time. We will never find another God like Jehovah. And his name is who is what God is. And then there's Azariah and his name means Jehovah has helped. Jehovah has helped. Of course, we read in, in these, these names. You look at all these Hebrew names, and what they mean is that when their parents named them, they looked at this child and said, I'm going to name them something that declares the glory and the work and the person of Almighty God. I'm going to name them something that says this is what God has planned, this is what God has purposed, this is what God is going to do in their lives, and I'm going to name them that. I'm going to declare the glory of God through this life. Now, the Babylonians gave them names, and as we mentioned earlier, they named Daniel, uh, Belshazzar, and the other three we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how they're most popular to us. But it wasn't their given names. That's what the Babylonians named them. And we don't have the time to go through all of those names individually, but suffice it to say this morning that all of these Babylonian names that were given to them, they didn't speak of the glory of God. They didn't speak of the grandeur of his person and the work that he has in our lives. They simply spoke of worldly, either they emphasized either worldly treasures or positions. So they were telling these men, what they really were telling these men is if you really want to be something in this life and in this world, your hope and your trust will not be in God, but it will be in what you're able to achieve and what you're able to attain. And also, if you can't achieve and if you can't attain, you're less than. The world wants you to think that if you can't attain its positions, its notoriety, and its treasures, then you're not what you need to be. And 
the second thing that we see very quickly here happening is not only did they try to change these men's names, they also tried to change these men's diets. Verse 5 says this, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now there's a, there's an argument that arises here and says what is the nature of these what are what's the nature of these delicacies that are being offered to them some people suggest that these were foods that had been offered to idols and false gods and then set on the king's table and there's a there's a good debate going back and forth on that we don't see anything to validate that necessarily but there's a good argument there because in verse 8 it says that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself before God by partaking of the king's portion so he refrained but I find interesting here John Gill's commentary on this passage and it says this that these things were offered to the Hebrew children as a bait and a snare to allure and entice them to make them in love with the country and the condition in which they were and forget their own. Let me read that again. These things were offered to them as a bait and a snare to allure and entice them to make them in love with the country and the condition in which they were and to forget their own. I want to remind you today that the way that these young men ended up in Babylon was not by their own free will, it was not by choice, but it was by captivity that they were led enslaved into Babylon. And, and this commentator suggests here that they were offered all these things to make them fall in love both with the country which was not where they belonged and the condition which was slavery in which God had delivered them from centuries before. And I believe in part that this could be true because we'll mention it again in a little bit, but we've already seen this work with their ancestors in times past. As God was delivering them out of a condition and towards a country that he had planned for them, they longed back for the flesh pots in Egypt. And what is happening here is that the Babylonians change their names to try to make them forget who they are and they change their diets to make them forget where they belong and to make them fall in love with where they are. However you look at this, there's a plan in place to make these young men look and behave a certain way. They're being immersed in a system. They're being trained in a language. They're being given an identity that doesn't belong to them. There's a, there's a work afoot to mold and to shape them into conformity, into the conformity of Babylon. Keep it in mind, these are Hebrew children. These are God's chosen people. And the king of this world, the most powerful man on the planet at the time, has come in and has taken them captive and is working to conform them to the mold and the model of the world. And then we see very rapidly some unfolding here that Daniel begins to lead a resistance. And, and it says here in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You know, I imagine Daniel sometimes walking down the streets of Babylon or through the palace courts, and I can almost see people running by him and they're trying to get his attention and they're calling out and they're saying, Belshazzar, and Daniel just keeps on walking. And they call again and say, Belshazzar, and he keeps walking. And finally they go, Daniel. And he's, hey, you talking to me? Huh? What? And I don't know if they ever got Daniel to respond to his Babylonian name, but they never got him to partake of the Babylonian diet. 
And what Daniel illustrates for us in this, we look at verses 14 and 16, and it says this of the eunuch. It says, So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus, thus the steward took away their portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now what Daniel illustrates for us in this simple action is that you don't need everything that this world affords in order to do well. If your purpose is to honor God first and foremost and stay away from the things that have no expediency in our lives and our spiritual walks and things that draw our attention away from the Lord, God has a way of circumventing the technicalities of getting around it. The world says that in order for you to advance, you have to bend, you have to bow, you have to conform, you have to adapt, you have to adopt. But here in this simple thing, and we're going to get to it a little bit later, but Daniel illustrates for us that it is not necessary to compromise your faith or your walk with the Lord or who you are as a believer in order to do well. Because God has a way. And we see all of this transpiring and we understand the goal that is, that is afoot here to change these men from who God has destined and designed, determined them to be and to conform them into the image of the world. And we see here that Daniel takes his stand, he and his friends, and they fare all the better for it. Those are two things, and we'll get to the third in just a moment. But right now, I want to turn your attention to the fact that Babylon is all around you. It's all around you. There is a Babylonian spirit in this world today, and it's working to conform you and I until we look and behave a certain way. It's trying to mold you into the form of this world and press you into the image of something unlike who God has created you to be. It wants you to look like the world and talk like the world, and behave like the world, and believe like the world, and it pounds, and it pounds, and it pounds with its influence constantly and consistently trying to get you to adapt and adopt a new image and a new diet. And on every hand, there's someone or something that's warring against you to try to get you to change your name. God has given you an identity. God has given, God has given you a name. And the name that he has called you is redeemed and restored. The name that he has called you is victorious and blessed. He has called you precious and loved. He has called you chosen and an overcomer. He has called you favored and prosperous. And all these things the Lord has declared over your life. But there's a Babylonian spirit in this world that wants to change your name. And instead of being identified with the blessings of God, he wants you to identify yourself with ways that make you feel less than what you're supposed to be if you don't have what this world offers. If you can't achieve a certain status, he calls you a failure and worthless. If you can't live up to a certain standard, he calls you defeated and broken. If you don't have the right kind of relationships, he tries to tell you that you're not loved. The problem with this is that if you and I are going to gain ground in this life, we're going to have to stop responding every time the enemy calls us something contrary to who God has said that we are. You see, the devil says that we're broke and there's no way out and we'll mourn on the sofa for three days in a pit of despair. The devil says that we're failures and we respond in kind by giving up on our dreams and our visions. And the devil calls us defeated and instantly we're on the sidelines waving our little white flags of surrender and saying, well, I guess this is right. Maybe I am defeated. I've got to tell you today, church, stop 
answering the call every time the Babylonian influence calls you something that's contrary to the identity that God has given you. Not only is there a spirit trying to change your name, but he's trying to change your diet as well. He offers a daily fare to make you feel like where you are isn't such a bad place after all. It happened to the Israelites in Egypt. They, had, they too had eaten of the goodness of the land. And when they got out in the desert, it didn't matter that they were living in God's provision. It didn't matter that they were on their way to attaining the promise. It didn't matter that they were about to walk into God's destiny. They still looked back and said, oh, to be in Egypt again where I could satisfy my flesh. If the enemy can get you full enough of the things of this world... You'll lose your appetite for the things of God. And Daniel says to them, listen, you may call me all the names that you want to, but you're not going to feed me on your confusion. And I'm telling you, church, there's far too many of us that are pulling up at the table of confusion and we're feasting on the fare of this world. We're listening to everything that the adversary has to say. And i got to tell you this, when you're taking more information off the evening news and the mainstream media than you are from Jesus, you're eating the wrong diet. When you're feeding your thought life with more, more with social media and in the entertainment of this world than you are with the word of the Lord, you're partaking of the wrong diet. Jesus says this, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And you're here this morning and you say, well, Pastor, I hear you say all that stuff, but I just don't understand. What's the harm in partaking of these things? Furthermore, Pastor, I would say that I don't like to read. And I certainly don't like to read the Bible. Because I believe I can be a Christian without all that. And I'm not going to argue the validity of that. Maybe you can. But I don't want to be a Christian in name. I want to be a Christian in life. I want to be a Christian in reality. I want to be an overcomer. I want to be victorious. I want to know who I am and where I stand. And when the rubber hits the road, that's where I want to be. Not wafting off someplace else, but I want to know where I stand. And you may be a Christian and never pick up your word, but you won't be a victorious one. You cannot not know your identity and feast on the fare of this world and know who you are and where you stand and be a victorious believer. It's not going to happen. You'll be one of those people suffering uh, mourning on the sofa three, four, five days at the time. Your Facebook feed will look like an episode of Dr. Phil. You'll have all your depression and disparity out there by volumes. Woe is me. I can't get ahead. Now, let me, let me just illustrate something here for you. I've got this nice, subtle colored board here. And I want to ask you something. What color is this board? What's that? Green. green. Everybody agrees it's green. You sure? Is what you say? Who said, who said it's what I see? That's right. That's right. Well, you can clearly see that this is green. Right? So you know it's green because you see that it's green. Can I tell you something? You don't know that it's green because you see that it's green. Because when you behold with your eyes, there's nothing about seeing that interprets for you that this is the color green. Your optic nerve simply sends an impulse to your brain that your brain interprets. And your brain interprets this to be the color of green, not because you see it, but because you've been told that this is the color green. Now, if we could have, you know, it would be a cruel and unusual thing, and I certainly don't advocate it. So if any of you are kind of sensitive to being offended by things, please understand that 
you know, disclaimer first. But if we could have taken enough people to fill this half with people and we shielded them away from any information or influences about the colors of this world and we told them this is red and we held this up to them and we said, listen, this is, this is the color red. Every time you see this, your, your optic nerve is going to send a signal. Your brain is going to identify this as the color red. Over here, we'd take another half, we'd seclude them away, and we'd spend a lifetime telling them this is the color blue. Every time that your eyes behold this, it's going to send a signal to your brain. Your brain is going to interpret this as the color blue. Then I would come in here this morning, we'd bring everybody in. And I would stand up here and I'd hold this and I'd say, what color is this? And this half over here would shout red, that half over there would shout blue. And before lunchtime, we could have a church split. Why? Because we would have a house full of people with a perception that was uninformed or ill-informed of what the truth of the matter is. We have so many people that are running around in the church and they're relying on an uninformed or ill-informed perception of the way things are. Do you want to know, you sit around and scratch your head and you say, how in the world can some of the people in mainstream denominations look at some of the things going on in the world and say this is right? I can tell you why. It's because they have left the foundation of understanding, which is the truth of God's Word, and they're looking at it with a natural and ill-informed perception, and they're saying, I don't, say any, I don't see anything wrong with it. The safeguard for you and I, however, is not to rely on our own selves. The Word says there's a way that seems right unto a man. The Word says lean not unto your own understanding, but in all things trust in the Lord and He'll direct your paths. You see, a shortfall in the body of Christ, a lot of times, one great hazard is that we've got a church full of folks. We've got them running around. They're making decisions and they're passing judgments simply based on their feelings and their perception of things in the natural man. And it's not informed by the word of the Lord. We might think that we're doing everything right and we can't figure out why we're not getting ahead. And the error is that most judgments come with the preface that says, well, the way I see it, or I don't see anything wrong with it. And the problem may be the way you're seeing it. Or at least the way you're interpreting or the grid through which you're interpreting what you see. Church, we're living in a land of confusion. I said we're living in a land of confusion. We are living in a land that is completely just inundated with a Babylonian spirit that is constantly and continually trying to change our identity and is constantly, continually offering to us a fair of this world to make us fall in love with where we are so that we have no hunger and no desire for that heavenly kingdom of which we are truly citizens through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what you and I have got to do is we've got to get out and we've got to stay out of Babylon. Some of you are thinking along with me here this morning, and you might be thinking right now, well, goodness, Pastor, you said that we're surrounded by it, so I don't know but one way out, and that's to die. And I wasn't really looking forward to that here on the brink of a brand new year. These influences are all around us, and there seems to be no escape. But Jesus teaches us in Scripture that you are in the world, but you're not of the world. And you can be in the world without the world being inside of you. And Paul writes to the Roman church and he says this in chapter 12, verse 2. 
do not conform to the pattern of this world. That voice, that influence, that Babylonian influence is constantly trying to press you into a pattern of this world. And Paul cautions the believer and says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be changed, be something different by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You've got to renew your mind in the Word of the Lord. You've got to renew your mind in the truth of God so that you can learn your identity, so that you can learn your purpose, so that you can learn your worth, and you can learn your victory, the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. Allow that Word to renew your mind, to renew your heart so that you'll know who you are in Christ Jesus. So that you'll know where you belong, where your place is. You won't be overwhelmed and you've got to say to the influences of Babylon that are in your life, get out and stay out. Get out and stay out. I'm not answering to the names you're calling. I'm not feasting on the distractions you're placing in front of me. Get out and stay out. I won't settle for less than what God has in store for me. I won't be comfortable in confusion. I'm going to walk in the revelation of the word of the Lord. Number three. Number one, they changed their names. Number two, they tried to change their diet. Number three there was a miracle moment in the lives of each one of these four men. And had they chosen the Babylonian influence, these men would have simply faded from the pages of history and we wouldn't be here in 2020 talking about their legacy today. They would just be nameless faces in the mass of human history who came and passed across the scenes of time and left. But no, no, no. These aren't those type of people. These are extraordinary people because they made up their mind in a world of confusion, in a world that was pressing on them, and a world that was pushing against them and everything that God had destined for them to stand up and say, Oh, no, king. No, 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 we're not going to bow to the world system. We're not going to give up on God's desire for us. We're not going to turn our back on the will of God, but we're going to press in and we're going to press on and we're going to hold fast until we see deliverance come. We're going to hang on until we see our miracle. And they all faced a moment. Every one of these young men eventually had a defining moment in their lives and it was a moment when God stepped in. It was a moment when God stepped into their situations and they received a miracle that was exceeding abundantly above anything that they could have asked or thought. For some it was a fiery furnace. For some it was a lion's den. But I say again, had they succumbed to the counsels of the Babylonian influence, we probably wouldn't know their stories today. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were promoted. We read about those young men being cast into a fiery furnace. But before that, we read about three young men who said, Listen, king, I don't know if God's going to deliver us from this fiery furnace or not. But this is what I do know. I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until the day of Christ Jesus. And we're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. We're going to stand right here on the promises of God. And the Word says, that when they came out, they went in the fire, three of them, there were four of them while they were in there. One likened to the Son of Man, and when they came out, it says they were promoted. They were promoted. 
Daniel, and gentlemen, you can go ahead and distribute those sacraments while I make this final point here. They told Daniel, they said, give up on your faith. Give up on your prayer life. Give up on your expectancy of God to ever do anything. You've been here in Babylon for all these years. You were a young man when you came. You're an old man now. Just give it up. You're only to pray to this image that we've erected of the king of this land, the king of this world. You don't, you don't call on Jehovah anymore. Daniel said, you know what, I've been, I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken or, God, or God's seed begging bread. He's been faithful to me this far and I'm not giving up on him now. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. Some trust in horses and some in chariots, but I'm going to bust my eastern window open and I'm going to bow my face before God every day and I'm going to continue to call on the name of God. They throw Daniel in that lion's den. God put a muzzle on those lions, made those fierce animals a pillow for him at night. He laid down and rested in the peace and the goodness of God all night long. They finally came back and hauled him out, and it says afterward, Daniel prospered. I want to tell you today, church, if you want to gain ground in this life, you're going to ignore the Babylonian influences in this world. Those voices that are trying to change your name. Those voices that are calling you a failure. Those voices that are, are saying to you, you're depressed and you're anxious. There's a, there's a voice that's going to speak over your life in the days to come. And it's going to say to you that you're depressed and you're going to say you're a liar. I've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's a voice that's going to speak over your life and say, you ought to be anxious. And you're going to say, for what? I've got the peace of God that passes all understanding. There's a voice that's going to speak to you and say, you're defeated. You ought to give up and you ought to turn back. And something's going to rise up on the inside of you and say, I may be pressed, but I'm not crushed. I might be persecuted, but I'm not destroyed. I'm, I'm not abandoned. I might be struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I've been made more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved me. Get out, you lying spirit. You say, Pastor, why are you serving communion right now? I thought maybe you'd invite us to get up and run laps around the sanctuary or something today. And I just want to invite you to stand. I want to invite you to stand and I want you to hold today a cup and bread that is symbolic simply of a body that was broken. that when we are sick we can say by his stripes I am healed that when the enemy comes in and says you are bound and you are worthless <laughs> you can remember that you were so loved that he shed his blood for you that you are not worthless because the Lamb of God gave His life for you. You see, in my Bible, in words of red, it says this. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And today, before I send you back out into a world that is inundated with the Babylonian influence that lies to you and tells you every reason that you have to feel defeated and worthless and less than, I want to remind you today that 2,000 years ago, Jesus, 
Jesus Christ stretched out his arm on an old rugged cross and permitted himself to be nailed there. He gave his back to the smiters and his beard to those that would pluck it from his face. And in a humble submission, he gave his life and he surrendered everything that through his great sacrifice, you and I would stand in remembrance of what God has done for us and we would declare victory in Jesus and we would never bow and we would never succumb to the influences of this world, but we would stand victorious until the time of our miracle and the moment of God showing up in our lives and doing great things and propelling us forward. Oh God, I thought I'd have it together here by the second service. Sometimes I just think we just need to concentrate on losing it. Just being broken before God and the realization of everything that he's done for us. God, I want to thank you for everything that you've done. Everything that you've done for us, Lord. God, you have secured for us a future and a hope. Through your resurrected body, Lord, we declare and decree a promise today that we will be the head and not the tail. God, that your plan and your will is to prosper us and to give us good things. God, I feel your anointing in this house today. God, I feel that you're moving in hearts right now. Lord, I sense in my spirit that you in this moment of stillness are encouraging people right now. God, I believe that there are some in this place right now that are being built up in their faith. There is a, there's an influence that has badgered them, that has lied to them and harassed them. But God, I sense right now, Lord, with sacraments in hand and a remembrance of everything that you've done, I sense that there's a faith rising. There's a spirit of victory that's beginning to rise up on the inside of them that's drowning out the lie of a Babylonian influence in their lives. They're getting ready to gain ground. They're getting ready to increase momentum towards your destiny and your purpose in their lives. They're headed for a miracle moment. God, we stand in this place right now with symbols in hand of a broken body and shed blood and we serve notice on the kingdoms of darkness that we have the victory. Not only do we have the victory moving forward, we will enforce the victory. We will ignore every lying influence over our lives. We will, we will delve into, discover, and stand firm in the truth of your word the purpose of your calling and we will no longer no longer bow before the systems and the voices of this world because we don't need it because our God is able to exalt us even when we have not bowed before the gods of this world and we thank you for the promise today and we thank you for the body that was broken and the blood that was shed to secure it. Because we declare boldly with sacraments in hand this morning that the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and in him they're amen. And we thank you for the bread today. And we thank you for this cup and all that it represents. 
We ask you now, Lord, to bless it to the nourishment of our inner man. Bless it, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our lives as we stand firmly on the finished work of Calvary and the truth of your word. Lord, bless every individual under the sound of my voice today with courage to take a stand, to say to the Babylonian influences, get out and stay out. You have no place in my life. So Lord, we receive this bread and this cup with gladness today. In Jesus' name, let's share the bread together today. Let's also share the cup. Now this is what I want you to do. Right now I want you to think about that vexing spirit that has been trying to fill you with anxiety and depression. I want you to think about that lying spirit that has spoken to you and has called you less than, defeated, unloved, and unworthy. And right now in the presence of God, I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to thank him that that voice is a lie. That, that thing that has been spoken over your life is a lie. And in these closing moments, I want you to rejoice in the truth. And I want you to give God glory for everything that he's done for you and what he continues to do for you and the way that he continues to bless you and thank him for the promise that he has for you and thank him that Babylon, a place of confusion, is not your home, but you belong to a good and a large land that is flowing with milk and honey and it's full of the goodness and the blessing of God. Lift him up and praise him and give him thanks this morning. Now, we are well past our time, but our worship team's going to lead us here this morning. And if, and only if, you have the victory today, you can consider yourself dismissed. But if you're here and you say, Pastor, I need somebody to agree with me, I'm in a war. I've been hearing that lie of the adversary ringing my ear over and over again. And today I need to leave this place with a renewed sense of victory in my heart. I want to assure you that these altars are open. And maybe as everybody else is leaving, maybe you need to be coming to the altar. But if that's you today, as they begin to lead and they begin to close out, would you make your way? We want to pray with you today because we don't want a single soul to leave this place the way you came. But we want you to leave here with the victory today. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. If you can go with the high hand of victory, then go in Jesus' name. But if you need prayer this morning, we welcome you to these altars. And we believe God can work a miracle in your life. Amen. God bless you. We love to see you at midweek, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. We love to see you here. God bless you, church.